Hello, I'm Tom Gosling, Executive Fellow at the European Corporate Governance Institute, and I'm here today with Henri Cervais, Professor of Finance, and Richard Breeley, Professor of Corporate Governance at London Business School. And we're going to discuss his paper, Do Consumers Care About ESG? Evidence from Barcode Level Sales Data, which he's written with Jean-Marie Mayer from the Wharton School, Jiaying Wei from Southwestern University of Finance and Economics, and Stephen Chong Zhao from the University of Texas. So Henri, thanks very much for taking the time to speak to me today. Thanks for uh, having me. I very much look forward to our conversation. So it's, it's often said that part of the business case for ESG is consumer taste. So um, if you've got consumers and particularly younger consumers caring a lot about the environment and social issues, then firms that ignore ESG will find consumers voting with their feet. But it's often really unclear how far we can take this this line of argument. And um, as a father of teenagers, as I know you are too as well, Henri, I know that what people say about their attitudes to responsible consumption and what they do is often separated by uh, quite a large margin. And so what really interested me about your paper is the way you use real life data to, to get at this question. So um, to start with, could you just explain how your work, which looks at the impact of ES, uh, in, sorry, ES, which is environmental and social issues, that looks at the impact of ES on cash flows, how does this fit in with the existing literature that looks at how ES could affect uh, firm value? Uh, well, I mean, there is, of course, a, a large literature that has been trying to study the effect of environmental and social performance on, on both firm value and on profitability. Mm. And, and most of this research actually suggests that there is a positive relation, although there's some there's certainly some articles that find the opposite. Mm. Uh, but over what over you know, the existing work, we really make two uh, two contributions. First, you know, when you relate two variables, you know, there is always the issue of causality. Mm -hmm. Two variables may be correlated, but mm -hmm. maybe there's actually a third variable that drives both ENS performance, environmental and social performance, and profits. And this could be innovation in the company. It could be the exact mix of products. Um, it could be the markets where they sell those products. And our research design and, and data, which is something uh, I know we'll, I'm sure we'll get to, mm -hmm. will allow us to sidestep uh, these concerns. Right. The second issue, of course, is that the exact mechanism that, that leads to this positive relation is not really very well understood, right? If you find a, a positive relation between value and environmental and social efforts, you know, it could be because investors uh, just enjoy holding stocks of, of high ENS firms yeah. uh, because they derive extra utility from that. Or it can come from employees who prefer to work for um companies with higher environmental and social uh, performance possibly even at lower salaries or it could come from the supply chain uh where you know suppliers are, are looking at their their customers uh and and saying you know we we really want you to do more uh ens because you know our our own um uh, stakeholders are asking for it and finally of course it can come from from the the customer and the consumer and so the great thing I think about what we're able to do is we can really explore this consumer channel yeah. in a, a lot of greater detail uh, and, and so shed light on that and separate it out from these other potential channels. So let's get into the data set that you use then, how you set up the study and, and, and how that enables you to get these very granular insights. Can, can you talk us through that? Sure. Uh, so. So in our analysis, we're using data from the Nielsen Retail Scanner database. And this database has comprehensive information on prices and quantities sold of specific products at the retail store level in the United States at a weekly frequency. And it has very extensive coverage. Approximately 50% of all retailers participate in this exercise. Wow. Uh, and, and there is very granular detail on the product. So we have more than 1,400 product categories. And so the nice thing about what we can do as a result is we can really look at very similar products that are sold at exactly the same point in time and exactly the same location. We're going to aggregate stores at the county uh, level in the U.S., uh, but of course produced by different companies. Mm. And so anything that is specific to the product category or the period of time or the location of the producer, um, all that can essentially be removed from, uh, from our analysis. And, and just to give you a sense of the granularity, you know, if you think about corn chips and tortilla chips and potato chips, they are three different products. Right. So you know, we're going to be able to compare 
two sets of corn chips sold in the same county by different producers and seeing how consumers react to that. Wow. So um, that, that's extremely, uh, extremely granular. So, so now let's come to the punchline of the paper. You, you look at how a firm's environmental and social rating affects subsequent sales and you find a significant effect. And so what is the effect you find and, and how big is it? Yeah, so as I said, we, we compare uh, local sales of specific products across producers with different environmental and social ratings. And indeed, we find a strong positive relation between these ratings in a given year and sales in the subsequent year. And to get you to give you sort of an idea of the of the magnitude of the effect, if you increase this environmental and social rating by one standard deviation uh, of its distribution in any given year, the sales of that product in a given county increase by almost 10% in the following year. That's that's a pretty astonishing impact, really. Nearly 10% is, is obviously an extremely financially material number. That's for a one standard deviation change in, in, in rating. Um, I'm guessing these ratings might be quite stable for a given company. I mean, ha, ha, what, what is the typical movement in rating for a given company? No, you, you are absolutely right. What we're essentially doing in this comparison and measuring the standard deviation is look at how much variation there is in environmental and social ratings across companies. Mm -hmm. But of course, if you're a company that's looking at these data, you're, you also want to say within the company over time, mm -hmm. how much variation is there in, in, you know, in my own ENS performance. Mm -hmm. And we find that sort of the, the variation within companies is about half of the variation uh, across companies. Okay, so it's still pretty. It's still pretty big, then. It's still it's still pretty substantial. But of course, you know th that variation is there. It's mm. still going to require possibly a substantial expense to improve. Uh, you know, to to go up in that variation. So we are by no means saying that all companies should take our evidence and decide. Oh, we're going to just increase ENS, mm -hmm. and this is just going to you know increase our sales. Uh, mm. It might well increase your sales, but getting your environment and social performance up is also going to be costly, of course. Mm. And so ultimately, it's for executives to trade off the benefits and the cost. What we are doing, I think, is, is clarifying what the benefits could be. Yeah. Once you know what the benefits could be, it's going to be more you know, straightforward for, for executives to, to assess whether it's worth the investment and the cost. And, you know, some changes might be cheaper, of course, than than others. Um, so, so coming to executives, um, Alan Jope, um, the former CEO of Unilever, once um, said that consumers will choose greener products, but only if they're as good as the alternatives and don't cost any more. And, and in your study, you did look at whether the sales increase came through volume or price. And, and what did you discover? And was that consistent with Alan's statement? Or did you find a different different well, our, our results are indeed uh, consistent with with Alan's contention so at you know in, in some of our tests we take the sales and essentially we split it up into the number of units sold and then the price per unit and virtually all of the effect that we find comes from units sold uh, not unit right. so if if you know if firms uh, improve their environmental and social performance at least from from our evidence suggests that they should not count on you know the ability to increase their prices yeah, but yeah. holding the price constant, they they should be able to uh, to sell a higher volume. Very interesting, and uh, and so we've got this headline effect that's that's pretty big, but you find it's quite interestingly varied for different demographic groups. So what are the key dimensions of this? So we looked at at three dimensions uh, specifically. We looked at income, we looked at education, and then we looked at political you know ideology or or inclination and specifically there whether you vote for democrats or republicans now of course we we don't have that for individual households but this data is available in the us at the county level right. and that's the great thing about our analysis we aggregate sales at the county level so you can see whether these results that i discussed earlier whether these results are stronger in counties that, that have higher or lower median income, higher or lower levels of education, more Democrats or more uh, you know, Republican voters. And so when we put uh, these three demographics together, essentially we find that the, the sensitivity of sales to environmental and social performance is higher in democratic counties and counties with higher average income. So it suggests that, that these are the, uh, the types of, of um, uh, consumers who are particularly interested uh, and susceptible to changes in a firm's environmental and social performance. 
Yeah, it's fascinating. So, so much seems to come back to uh, to political leanings um, these days. But I mean, you also look at how ES, um, sorry, environmental and social rating changes uh, at a firm also affect local product market competition. I thought this was really fascinating. Can you talk a bit about the market dynamics of the effect that you observe? Yeah, so what's interesting is, and, and maybe it's not surprising in a way, but what, what we still found very interesting is that what matters is not only your environmental and social performance, but also the ratings of your local product market rivals, mm -hmm. and particularly that rival that has sort of the highest rating, the one in, in that specific county selling the product that you're selling that's doing the best in, in uh, ENS. And so what we can do is we can hold your rating constant. So we can control for that, holding the firm's rating constant mm -hmm. and just see what happens to your sales when um, uh, your rivals uh, are increasing their uh, environmental and social ratings. Mm -hmm. And so we find that that actually has a strong effect and the effect is almost as strong as the firm's own environmental and right. social ratings. So, you know, if, even if you keep your ENS performance constant, if your rivals improve, you're going to have to improve too, just to sort of maintain your status quo in terms of your, your sales level. So this is really interesting. So, so there's a positive pull towards improvers of, of, EA, of ratings, not just a kind of a negative cost from being involved in a controversy. Have I understood that right? Uh, yes. Yeah, so if you look at how, how we actually uh, come up with our measure, it's really a combination of strengths and concerns. So strengths give a positive weight to our measure. Concerns yeah. give a, you know, give a, a negative measure. So it's certainly not an article that only focuses on negative uh, environmental and social news and sort of sees whether you suffer for that. You know, we, we very much pay attention to kind of positive mm -hmm. investments and improvements that, that consumers can become aware of. So, so one of the things that have you know puzzled me a little bit about the the the, the analysis was that the, the um, environmental and social ratings of brand owners can be quite remote from the brand itself. And I mean, the example here is I, mean, I couldn't tell you whether the shampoo I use is made by Unilever or Procter and Gamble, but it's almost certainly uh, one of those two. And, and so I'm not sure how I would make a connection between a change in the ES rating of one of these firms and which shampoo I buy. I mean, is there anything in, in your work that tells us whether there are particular types of product or environmental or social event that drive the results? And are they ones where the brand owner or the event itself is particularly salient to the consumer in some way? Or, or is there another channel by which consumers might figure this out. I mean, so you do some work on both how the salience and, and the particular type of ES News event affects results. So what insight can you give to what's really going on here? Yeah, so there, there are really two sets of results I'd like to speak to in, in addressing this question. So first, of course, you are absolutely right that for some brands, the name of the producer and the name of the brand don't correspond. And so as you, know, as you point out, you know, for the average consumer, maybe it's not clear who's been producing their brand. And so how can I possibly uh, react to, to their environmental and social performance? Mm. But of course, what we have to keep in mind is that you sort of talk about the average consumer and, you know, the average consumer may not necessarily care, but mm. some consumers may care. And of course, those consumers who do care, they, you know, they make sure they know who does the production. That's right. exactly you know, th that's exactly what they want to do. That is that is sort of their the reason for going after this. So they will look at the name of the company on the product or they will, mm. in fact, uh, do their research. Mm. But of course, I fully agree that that it's not going to be a perfect match. And some uh, some, you know, consumers are, are just not going to know. Now, to the extent that consumers cannot make the link, we are in some sense kind of understating the, the true effect because we're just adding noise to the data. We're adding a bunch of observations where you know the relationship is not really there um, together with a bunch of observations where the relationship is 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 there so so you might actually think that that our effect is is maybe almost a you know a sort of a lower yeah. bound on on how big the effect might be yeah then, and that, yeah and that is a great point you make actually that you know a five percent impact on sales only needs five percent of consumers to, to to take notice doesn't it right uh, absolutely but then we 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 do uh, you know some other tests to, to 
to get at this salience argument, uh, you know, mm. in, in a different way. Mm. Uh, and, and there's really two things we do. So the first thing is we look at negative ENS news mm. uh, and we look at subsequent sales then. Now, of course, people still have to find out if there is negative news about a company, they still have to link it to a brand. But of mm. course, if the news comes out, that might sort of, again, uh, encourage them to maybe find out a little bit more. Mm. Uh, and so we do find, and here we really, we look at the monthly level we looked at, uh, you know, we look at subsequent sales and we find that over the six months after negative ENS news per negative story, your sales decline by about 2%. Um, right. So, you know, it's it's not as a large an effect, but there is still something going on. And then the other thing that we study is we study natural environmental disasters. And, and we look at consumers who are located in counties close to the disaster, but not the disaster county itself. You know, that county is going to go through all kinds of you know, turbulence. But we look at consumers located within 500 miles of, of that disaster. And what you find is that the sales within uh, you know, those counties become more sensitive to environmental and social ratings if something happened you know, nearby. Because that, again, increases kind of consumer awareness about these issues. It makes the salience larger now. Maybe you know, interestingly or maybe disappointingly, uh, you know, this effect lasts about three quarters. So after three quarters, they seem to kind of have forgotten about all right. this. So we go back to what we're doing. They're still paying attention to the company's environmental and social ratings. Yeah, but yeah. No longer sort of that heightened sensitivity that disappears again. Kind of has a decay. Yeah. I mean, that, that's so fascinating. I, I mean, Henri, thanks for for a great discussion and sharing the insights from your paper. And I, I think it's just so illuminating to have some real data to provide insight on this whole question of whether you can really do well by doing good, but also, you know, the role of this consumer channel. So thank you so much. My pleasure. I very much enjoyed the conversation, Tom. Thank you.